yeah, my name is Aziz. I'm one of the uh, cardiology residents here at the University of Toronto, uh, currently C2, doing my echo rotation at uh, St. Michael's. Um, basically, today I'm presenting echocardiography and the evaluation of rheumatic heart disease. Uh, a couple of reasons why I chose this topic. Uh, first of all, there was uh, a new guideline update in, uh, by ASE. Uh, it was published in November, so I thought this was a good opportunity for myself to review it and for everyone else as well. Uh, second reason is, um, although not common in Canada, we still see a lot of cases, uh, we still see quite a few cases here. And this will be a, an important topic for me when I eventually go back home to practice in Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, so some of the objectives I'll be, uh, we'll be going over during this talk. Uh, we'll have a brief review of the epidemiology, pathophysiology, and clinical presentation of rheumatic heart disease, both in the acute and chronic phase. Uh, recognizing the utility of echo in the diagnosis of acute, acute rheumatic fever, and then reviewing the echo findings of uh, a chronic rheumatic heart disease. So first of all, talking about epidemiology, it used to be a much more common disease before the era of uh, antibiotics, but now with antibiotics, it's not uh, common, not endemic at all in developed countries, al although certain parts of the world still have endemic cases, especially in Africa and uh, Southeast Asia, as uh, dictated by this map from the World Health Organization. Um, if you look at Canada, it's non-endemic, but uh, we still see quite a few cases from the uh, uh, from immigrants that come from endemic countries, and in, in the First Nation population, uh, there's also quite a few cases there. Uh, the pathophysiology is thought to be immune-mediated following infection with uh, grouped A streptococcus. Uh, the body as, uh, naturally develops antibodies against this uh, bacteria. These uh, antibodies can cross-react with both cardiac proteins and other proteins in the body to cause the manifestations of rheumatic fever uh, through a process called the molecular mimicry. Basically, the antibodies recognize these uh, pr uh, proteins as self-antigens and starts attacking different parts of the body. Uh, there's also a role of host susceptibility as not everyone that gets a strep infection will develop rheumatic heart disease. So there's certain factors that play into this that are beyond the uh, scope of the stock. Uh, the initial infection usually manifests as a tonsillopharyngitis. Uh, if not treated, two to four weeks, certain susceptible uh, patients can develop uh, the uh, um, symptoms of acute rheumatic fever. And then rheumatic heart disease is a uh, long-term consequence of uh, a repeated immune-mediated injury, as you can have uh, um, multiple bouts of acute rheumatic fever. This is just a, 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 a picture to describe the uh, pathophysiology. You get the initial infection, uh, which leads to tonsillopharyngitis, antibodies that attack different parts of the body, causing the, uh, the, the rheumatic heart disease syndrome and acute rheumatic fever. And then the end, uh, the end um, sequelae that we would want to try and avoid is you get cardiac chamber dilation, pulmonary hypertension, arrhythmia, especially atrial arrhythmias, and uh, heart failure. So I'm sure everyone's heard about the Jones criteria. It is a criteria to make the diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever, which we'll start talking about before getting into the chronic changes. It also serves as a mnemonic. So J, uh, you can get uh, joints, uh, usually a polyarthritis. Uh, C is for carditis. Now that is usually a pancarditis uh, that can affect any part of the heart. It could be the pericardium, myocardium, endocardium. Most commonly, it is a valvulitis. Uh, with the finding of uh, mitral uh, regurgitation or aortic regurgitation most commonly. N is for subcutaneous nodules, E, uh, erythema marginatum, which is a rash, and then the S is for syndam chorea, probably the least common uh, uh, finding in acute rheumatic fever. These are all the major and minor criteria. Uh, minor criteria, just to go over them, can be fever, uh, arthralgia rather than arthritis, a prolonged PR interval on ECG, increased ESR or CRP, and uh, leukocytosis. Uh, to make the diagnosis, you need two major criteria, or one major and one minor criteria. Um, just going into uh, carditis, when they develop these guidelines, what they meant by carditis, either a clinical finding of myocarditis or pericarditis, but when you have valvulitis, the only way to pick it up when they describe the criteria is by auscultation, listening for, for a heart murmur. 
So this raised the question, is there a role for echo in uh, acute rheumatic fever? Um, looking into, there's well, multiple studies done in the past 20 years looking into this, and they found that most uh, carditis is actually a silent carditis, as in you would not hear a, hear a murmur, but if you put the echo probe on, you would find changes uh, that's compatible with the valvulitis. So this led them to revise the Jones criteria back in 2015. The use of echocardiography was formally incorporated into the revised Jones criteria as a tool to diagnose rheumatic carditis, especially in silent carditis. And this is recognized as a major criteria. So this qualifies as a um, the finding of carditis and qualifies as a major criteria in the Jones, um, updated Jones criteria. Uh, this update significantly increases the, the diagnostic yield, which has implications because it allows us to identify cases, start prophylactic treatment earlier, and hopefully prevent recurrent episodes of acute rheumatic fever. Uh, this is the updated guidelines. Uh, not only did they add echo, but now they, it, it's divided into low-risk populations and uh, high, moderate to high-risk populations. They're quite similar between low-risk and high-risk. The only difference in the major criteria is uh, uh, it has to be a polyarthritis in low-risk populations. But in endemic countries and high-risk patients, it can be a poly or monoarthritis or even polyarthralgia. Uh, mono, uh, minor criteria, the only change, again, the polyarthralgia or monoarthralgia. Uh, and then the ESR cutoff has also changed and said 60 uh, in low risk and um, 30 in high risk. So what are the echo findings we are looking for in acute rheumatic fever? So mainly pathologic mitral aortic regurgitation, since they are most, the most common findings in the acute phase. We also look for morphologic changes consistent with valvulitis in the mitral and aortic valves. Now, finding isolated tricuspid or pulmonic involvement is seldom rheumatic in origin, uh, as the left-sided valves are more common. So mitral regurgitation. Not everyone that has mitral regurgitation will just label it as acute rheumatic fever, obviously. We have to meet a certain criteria. So it has to fulfill all four of these criteria. You have to see the uh, regurgitation in at least two views. The jet length needs to be more than two centimeters in at least one view, with a peak velocity of more than three meters per second. And you on uh, CW, you have to have a pansystolic jet in at least one envelope. Some of the morphologic changes associated with this, we're looking for annual, annular dilation, uh, cordial elongation, you can have cordial rupture, anterior or posterior leaflet tip prolapse, and then we can begin seeing the changes of nodular and thickening of the leaflets even in the uh, acute rheumatic fever um, uh, before development of rheumatic heart disease. In terms of aortic regurgitation, similar to MR, you must fulfill all four criteria, it has to be seen in at least two views, uh, a jet length of more than one centimeter in at least one view, peak velocity more than three meters per second, and a pan-diastolic jet in at least one envelope on uh, CW. The morphologic changes seen in the aortic valve, uh, again, similar to the mitral valve, leaflet thickening uh, with cutoffs. If you're younger than 20, you have to, uh, uh, the normal thickness is 0.67 millimeters, plus or minus 21. Uh, in the 20 to 60 age, it's 0.87, uh, plus or minus 0.27 millimeters. And above 60 is about 1.4 millimeters, plus or minus 0.5. Um, other morphologic changes we can see are cooptation defect, restricted leaflet motion, and uh, leaflet prolapse. So this is an uh, echo from a 10-year-old boy with acute rheumatic fever. Uh, unfortunately, it's hard to find video of uh, echo findings in acute rheumatic fever, so the best I could do is a picture. But here you can see actually cortical rupture of the anterior leaflet with a severe mitral regurgitation that's eccentric and posteriorly directed. You can see the torn cord here uh, on panel B with the red arrow. And you can see the nodular thickening of the mitral uh, valve leaflet tips uh, already starting to occur um, in this parasternal long axis and B as well. C shows us a uh, 3D echo showing the uh, nodular thickening of the leaflet tips. And then panel D, we, they take a look at the aortic valve, seeing that it is also involved with uh, uh, some thickening and calcification. So this is the formal ASE guidelines and using echo in acute rheumatic fever. Uh, echocardiography with Doppler should be performed in all cases of confirmed or suspected acute rheumatic fever. Echo and Doppler testing should be performed to assess whether carditis is present in the absence of auscultory, uh, auscultory findings 
particularly in moderate to high risk populations. And then it is reasonable to consider performing serial echoes in any patient with diagnosed or suspected acute dramatic, acute dramatic fever, even if you don't have carditis uh, at, uh, uh, to begin with. Uh, the reason for this recommendation is 20% of patients with acute dramatic fever will develop uh, recurrent episodes, and about 50% would uh, will, can develop uh, rheumatic heart disease uh, 10 years down the road. Uh, what they don't go into, there's not enough data to, uh, to really say how frequent the echo should be and for how many years these patients should be followed. So it's kind of left up to the clinicians to decide. Uh, and fin then finally, um, before echo, you'd hear a murmur and you say, okay, this is carditis if you have the uh, suspicion of rheumatic fever. But now with echo, if you hear a murmur and then you put the probe on and you don't find uh, findings consistent of that murmur being from a rheumatic origin, then you can argue the diagnosis and say, maybe this isn't rheumatic heart disease. Maybe this is something else. Uh, so now we go into the chronic changes, uh, the most common being rheumatic uh, mitral stenosis. Uh, it's the, uh, the most common finding in rheumatic heart disease. And uh, also rheumatic heart disease is the most common cause of mitral stenosis worldwide. Its main mechanism is caused by mitral valve leaflet thickening and commissural fusion. Uh, in chronic severe cases, you can see calcification of the valve annual and the annulus as well. What are some of the sequelae of this? So you have rise in left atrial pressures, left atrial dilation and remodeling, which can increase the risk of uh, atrial arrhythmias. Uh, increased pulmonary pressure is leading to pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary edema, and then the gradients across the mitral valve are always uh, um, flow dependent. So anything that can increase cardiac output, shorten diastolic filling time, such as increased heart rate, will worsen symptoms and worsen gradients across the valve. So now we go into how can we assess the degree of mitral stenosis. So the best way to do this is a multi-parametric approach. We can't just look at morphologic changes alone. We can't just use planimetry alone. We have to incorporate different things to uh, make sure more than one factor is um, shows that this is truly severe, moderate, or mild. So what are the morphologic changes we expect? Um, Sorry, before that, this is an important factor because it doesn't do, just help in making the correct diagnosis, but it also has therapeutic implications because it will determine if patients are candidates for a balloon valvuloplasty or not. We can evaluate the morphologic changes both by 2D and 3D echo. These are the morphologic changes we can expect to see. We evaluate the extent and pattern of commissural fusion. Uh, we look at the degree and extent of valve thickening, severity of valve narrowing, restricted motion, diastolic doming, and subvalvular abnormalities. Again, we use multiple views to evaluate this. We can use the parasternal short access, parasternal long, apical, uh, and then we evaluate both the mitral valve and the subvalvular uh, um, structures. So just a couple of videos here. This is a parasternal short access looking at the mitral valve. You can see thickening of the leaflet tips and commissural fusion. And this shows a classic uh, fish mouth appearance that described in uh, rheumatic mitral stenosis. Of note, you can see the LV is uh, functions preserved, which it commonly is in mitral stenosis as it uh, doesn't affect the systolic function of the left ventricle. As a parasternal long access, you can see uh, severe uh, thick thickening and nodularity of the mitral valve leaflet tips. Uh, you can with the um, motion. You can also see the diastol diastolic doming. I have a better video for that coming up next. An important feature about uh, differentiating uh, rheumatic mitral stenosis from calcific uh, mitral stenosis is um, in rheumatic uh, rheumatic mitral stenosis, the calcification and thickening usually affects the leaflet tips, and the mitral valve apparatus itself is spared. Whereas in calcific mitral stenosis, you would find the tips, the mitral valve itself, uh, the annulus, everything is calcified. So that's one of the tricks of uh, differentiating them. Uh, this is the video of the diastolic doming. Due to the commissural fusion and restricted of motion, you can see the leaflet tips don't move as well as the proximal part. So that's why you get the characteristic diastolic doming called the hockey stick sign. You can also see some, the aortic valve is a bit thick in here as well. 
And finally, you can you you also have calcification uh, and shortening of the uh, subvalvular structures as well and the cords. Next, we want to determine what the mitral valve area is. So there's multiple ways of doing this. First is by planimetry, which is the most uh, validated method. Uh, this is done in the parasternal short axis, can be done on 2D or 3D echo. Uh, this is a, an example on 2D echo. Uh, an important thing you want to make sure you're doing is uh, you want to make sure you're cutting right at the leaflet edges, because if you cut higher in the valve apparatus as seen in panel B, you can falsely make the um, mitral valve area look bigger. So a way of achieving this is try to cut at right at the subvalvular apparatus and then slowly tilt until you begin seeing the valve. That way you know, you know you're at the tip. Another and probably more accurate way of doing this is doing a biplane method uh, and have a line at the tips. That way you know for sure you're at the leaflet tips and not above. So these are different uh, um, planimetry echoes showing the different valve areas, uh, mild, moderate, and severe. So here we have a valve area of 3.2, 1.6, and 0 0.87. 3D echo gives us an advantage that we can assess the valve both from the atrial side or the ventricular side. It also helps in uh, Micro valves that have an orifice that's eccentrically oriented, it's difficult to get a true planimetry on 2D echo, but that is achievable with a 3D echo. And here's a video of it playing. And another 3D echo of the mitral valve. This is an example of how we can use a 3D echo at the bottom left in an eccentrically oriented valve to get a better idea of what the valve area is. So now we move on to hemodynamic assessments of the valve. So basically we want an assessment of the pressure gradient across the valve. We want to calculate uh, the mitral valve area by a pressure half time with a different method of getting the mitral valve area. And we want to estimate uh, PA pressures. Uh, the pressure gradients across the mitral valve are uh, done using continuous wave Doppler from the mitral inflow uh, from the apical windows, usually the apical four chamber, but look at the four chamber, two chamber, three chamber, the best view where you get a clear jet is where you can do your calculations. Uh, we have to keep in mind that transmitral gradients, like we said, are flow and heart rate dependent. So it's always important to uh, uh, comment what the heart rate is, because if you do the echo today at a heart rate of 60 or the echo a month from now at a heart rate of 90, that'll significantly change the gradients. Uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation, we want to take the multiple measurements because we have beat to beat variability and the gradients can differ from uh, one beat to the other just to get an average gradient. Uh, pressure half time. So what is it? It is the time required for the pressure gradient to decrease by half from its peak. Uh, it is inversely related to the mitral valve area. So the the longer the pressure half time is, the more severe the stenosis, the, the smaller the mitral valve area is. The equation, once we have the pressure half time, is we divide 220 by pressure half time, and that gives us an estimate about the mitral valve area. Um, here's a, a, a continuous wave Doppler and pulse wave Doppler of the mitral valve inflow. Uh, where they used, um, they traced the uh, uh, the inflow uh, to see what the gradient is, and you can see mild, moderate, severe. So mild is four, moderate six, severe with a gradient of eighteen. Uh, and then they also calculated the pressure at half times here. You can see in the severe, uh, more than one hundred and fifty milliseconds, two hundred twenty six here. So that's severe. Uh, some tips about pressure half time. Sometimes we have a bi biphasic uh, mitral valve inflow where it rapidly, um, initially rapid, the pre pressure rapidly decreases, then it tethers off. Uh, sorry, tapers off. So when doing the pressure half time on this flow, it's important to not take the red line. We should take the pressure half time of this later phase of diastole to get the true pressure half time. Some limitations of pressure half time, they're dependent on the relationship between the left atrium and left ventricle. 
So any factor that affects left atrial or LV compliance or LV diastolic pressure can affect the pressure at half time. For instance, if you have left ventricular hypertrophy, aortic insufficiency, insufficiency uh, or left atrial thrombosis, those can all affect pressure half times. Uh, the presence of MR also reduces the re reliability of uh, calculating a valve area by pressure half time. Uh, and then pressure half time can be misleading directly after a balloon valvuloplasty, and it's better to try and get an area by planimetry there. Uh, this is the AC guidelines for classification of mitral stenosis severity. So as you can see, a valve area of less than 1.5 severe, uh, 2.5 to 1.6 is moderate, more than 2.5 is mild. Pressure half time, usually 150 milliseconds is a cutoff for severe. Uh, mean gradients, again, this is dependent on the heart rate. These guidelines are based on a heart rate of 60 to 80. Less than 5 is mild, 5 to 9 is moderate, more than 10 is severe. And then finally, we evaluate the pulmonary artery uh, pressures. Uh, more than 50 is consistent with severe. Um, as we said, uh, we don't look at just one factor from these. We have to evaluate all four and see if they're consistent and increases, which increases the reliability of our diagnosis. Uh, occasionally, not all the data line up. In those cases, we can stress the heart by either stress echo or dibutamine echo to try and get those transmital gradients up and see if it truly is severe or not. Just a quick comment about mitral stenosis and pregnancy. Uh, as a lot of patients with rheumatic heart disease are in childbearing age, so this is a, 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 a topic that does come up. It is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. Uh, the reason for this is the increase in plasma volume and cardi uh, plasma volume and cardiac output in pregnancy can worsen the gradients, leading to increased pulmonary pressures. We can, if, if we have a patient that wants to have a child, we can consider stress testing prior to conception to evaluate the expected changes that might occur and see if she will need an intervention prior to uh, trying to conceive. Uh, rheumatic mitral regurgitation, um, also common in rheumatic heart disease. Uh, and again, whenever MR is there, we should try and determine the etiology before labeling it to uh, rheumatic changes. Uh, rheumatic MR is defined as mitral regurgitation with at least two morphologic features of a rheumatic valve that we talked about previously. Uh, it's mainly caused by uh, incomplete to leaflet coaptation due to thickening and scarring of the leaflets, as well as chordal shortening that restricts their motion. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, so here you can see um, a second mechanism that we didn't talk about. You can have pseudo prolapse. Uh, you can see the anterior leaflet here looks prolapsed, but that's just due to the uh, calcification and deform uh, deformation of the leaflets. Here we can say we can see severe MR that classify the criteria we talked about before. It's uh, that in the panel C the depth is longer than two centimeters, the velocity is higher than three meters per second, and then in panel A we can see the there's uh, more than two changes consistent with rheumatic heart disease. We have diastolic doming and we have thickening and calcification of the leaflet tips. In terms of quantifying MR severity, uh, we can look at the estimated regurgitant orifice. More than 40 would be severe MR. Uh, less than 20 is mild. In between is moderate. Regurgitant volume, more than 60 would be severe. Less than 30 is mild. In between is moderate. Uh, we can also look at the... the uh, being a contractor width, uh, more than 0 0.7 would be severe. And then we could look at uh, flow reversal in the pulmonary veins, which is also a uh, characteristic, uh, characteristic of severe MR. Uh, next, the second most affected valve would be uh, the, uh, the aortic valve. Um, it almost always occurs in the presence of rheumatic mitral valve disease. So if you have only the aortic valve involved, you should maybe try and consider alternative diagnoses because they're usually associated together. Uh, aortic regurgitation is more common than uh, severe stenosis. The morphological features uh, that you would expect in the aortic valve are commissural fusion. Uh, you have fibrotic thickening, retraction of the leaflet edges, giving a triangular or rounded orifice, and then varying degrees of calcification can be seen. This is an uh, example of... Uh, Thickening of the tips, and then you have systolic doming here rather than diastolic doming in uh, the mitral valve. 
again, this is a bed, uh, just a picture showing, uh, oh, sorry, this is a video as well. This is a different view, different patient, uh, same mechanisms. And you can see the mitral valve is also affected, like we said. Short axis view shows us calcification at the leaflet tips and commissural fusion as well. An important tip, similar to the mitral valve, rheumatic aortic stenosis, the calcifications are usually on the leaflet tips. As in calcific, traditional aortic stenosis, you can see the entire valve uh, is involved. Hemodynamic assessments of the aortic valve, uh, we want to get the aortic valve area, aortic valve mean gradients, aortic jet velocities. Uh, this is usually done on CW. You can see here a velocity uh, 5.4, greater than 4 is severe. And then doing the VTIs and max and assessing the max velocity, that gives us the mean gradients and estimated aortic valve area. Uh, this is, again, from the ASC guidelines uh, for, with the different cutoffs for um, mild, moderate, severe. Uh, severe aortic stenosis uh, with a velocity of more than 40, uh, sorry, more than 4, mean gradient more than 40, uh, and aortic valve area less than 1. Uh, rheumatic aortic valve regurgitation, like we said, more common than rheumatic stenosis. Uh, it is usually more severe than the stenosis if they coexist. Uh, main mechanism is retraction of the cusp edges due to the calcification and nodularity. Uh, the hemodynamic assessment, we want to get a CW, and we want to see this, the jet density, uh, flow reversal in the descending aorta, a pressure half-time less than 200, uh, we want to calculate uh, using a PISA method, the regurgitant volume and effective regurgitant orifice area. Uh, this is CW across the aortic valve, uh, showing severe aortic stenosis. They don't have the pressure halftime on there, but it looks less than uh, 200. And it's a dense uh, uh, jet as well. AC guidelines on cutoff. Again, you have ER uh, estimated regurgitant orifice. More than 30 would be severe. Regurgitative volume more than 60 would be severe. We want to look at flow reversals in the abdominal aorta and a pressure half time less than 200. So those are the most common affected valves, but the right-sided valves can be affected as well. Uh, tricuspid being more common than the pulmonic. Uh, it, uh, but saying that is still uncommon. When it does occur, it usually in the presence of left-sided lesions. Uh, again, with tricuspid valve stenosis, we want a multi-parametric approach. Uh, assessment includes the morphologic changes, transvalvular gradients, tricuspid valve area, pressure half-time, and we want to look at the right atrial chamber size. Morphologic features, uh, similar to the mitral valve, we want to look at extent and pattern of commissural fusion, degree and extent of valve thickening, severity of valve narrowing, restricted motion, and diastolic doming. So as we see here, we have the diastolic doming, we have thickening of the mitral valve leaflet tips. This is the apical four chamber showing the same thing. Uh, a method we can do to um, get a better assessment and try to move the probe a bit medially to get to the right ventricular apex to better see the tricuspid valve. You can see right atrial dilation here, which further supports tricuspid stenosis. And this is a 3D view of the tricuspid valve gives us the same advantages as in uh, mitral valve. If we have a centrally directed uh, uh, orifice, it's better to assess it in, uh, with a 3D view. And here we have a CW, a tricuspid uh, valve inflow, measuring uh, pressure half time. Here it's about 178 milliseconds. What are some supportive findings? So like we said, we look at the right atrium and measure its size, should be dilated in tricuspid stenosis. Another method is looking at the IVC, which should be dilated and collapses less than 50% in cases of severe tricuspid stenosis. Again, this is from the ASC guidelines. Um, it's not really uh, uh, classified to mild, moderate, severe, but uh, cutoffs indicating severe tricuspid stenosis is a mean pressure gradient uh, greater than five, uh, pressure half time of more than 190 and a valve area less than one. Now, tricuspid regurgitation is way more common in rheumatic heart disease than tricuspid, tricuspid stenosis. It's seen in uh, about 70% of cases. 
Uh, it's the third most common lesion following MS and MR, so it's even more common than involvement of the aortic valve. Uh, the trick of this, though, it can be primary or secondary. Primary is due to the uh, tricuspid valve itself being affected from rheumatic heart disease. Secondary, which is most common, is just uh, because of the elevated left side depression, it's only hypertension, you get TR. So primary TR um, is due to valvulitis, uh, chronic sequelae of rheumatic heart disease, uh, secondary to scarring, restriction of motion. Uh, an echocardiographic uh, diagnosis is made when TR is associated with typical diastolic doming and the expected changes we would see uh, from rheumatic heart disease. Secondary TR, like I said, by far most common. Uh, the primary reason for TR in rheumatic heart disease uh, as a result of elevated left-sided pressures and pulmonary hypertension leading to RV dysfunction and TR. Sorry, that says aortic valve, it should be tricuspid valve. And again, from the ASC guidelines, uh, classification of TR, EROA more than 40 is severe, regurgitant volume more than 45, vena contracted width more than 0 0.7. And we look at uh, if there's a flow reversal in the hepatic veins, which suggests severe TR. The least effective valve is the pulmonary valve. They are very rare. When it happens, it's in the presence of other valvular lesions. Uh, when it is present, it suggests advanced stages of rheumatic heart disease. Some of the morphologic changes you would expect, calcification and thickening of the leaflets, a domed appearance in systole, similar to what we saw in the aortic valve, best seen in the parasternal short access, uh, and similar to the tricuspid valve, 2D echo, uh, can't visualize all three leaflets in one plane. That's why 3D echo gives us an advantage in... Uh, both the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve, if we can, uh, if we're able to see it. Uh, hemodynamic assessments of pulmonary stenosis. So we want to get the pulmonary uh, valve area by the continuity equation. Peak velocity is more than four. Mean gradients more than thirty-five. Uh, there's no formal guidelines on pulmonary uh, uh, vein uh, uh, stenosis and severity, but since it's morphologic, uh, sorry. There's no formal guidelines on the pulmonary valve area and what it should be to be as severe, but since it's morphologically similar, the ASC suggests uh, a similar cutoff to the aortic valve of uh, less than one centimeter squared. Uh, rheumatic pulmonary regurgitation. So we most people have some degree of pulmonary regurgitation, mild and uh, mild to moderate. Uh, rheumatic pulmonary regurgitation is quite rare. Uh, if we see pulmonary regurgitation, again, it has to be in the presence of changes uh, suggestive of rheumatic heart disease. Otherwise, we can't attribute it to the uh, uh, disease itself. Uh, so those are the four valves uh, that we went through. But uh, as we see, a lot of the time you have mixed valve disease. So it's, it's some special notes here that we need to focus on. Uh, all the valves interact with each other, and therefore there's some areas we need to pay special attention to. So what if you have severe MS and severe aortic stenosis? So MS leads to an underfilled ventricle, which will affect the assessment of aortic stenosis. So you can have a valve area that's less than one, but you won't meet the cutoffs for severe in terms of your gradients or your velocities. And that's because the ventricle is underfilled. So that, as we all know, that's called low flow, low gradient AS. So we can see that in cases of severe mitral stenosis. Um, Typically, we get around this by, uh, in, in classic calcific aortic stenosis, we get around this by doing the butamine stress echo of the LV is depressed, which isn't the issue here because usually the LV is preserved in mitral stenosis. The other way we can do this is calcium scoring in uh, calcific aortic stenosis, but doesn't work quite as well with rheumatic aortic stenosis because there's not the same amount of calcification as traditional aortic stenosis. Uh, another consideration in patients that have mitral stenosis and severe AR, just because those two Doppler signals can inter intersect. Uh, so we should carefully try and distinguish the, uh, the jet of AR from the jet of uh, mitral valve stenosis. So this is just an example. You can see uh, there is severe mitral stenosis here that's directed towards the septum. So it goes into the jet of aortic insufficiency. Uh, so you can see in panel B, the jets are on top of each other. 
Uh, the way you can try and differentiate this is uh, usually um, aortic insufficiency start, the white arrow starts earlier in diastole. Uh, the uh, CW of mitral stenosis starts a bit later and lasts longer. So that's a, a couple of tricks that we can uh, tell the difference. Uh, pulmonary hypertension and rheumatic heart disease, again, a long-term sequelae defined as the mean pulmonary artery systolic pressure of more than 20. Now, the gold standard is uh, invasive right heart cath, but since it is invasive, we can do a right heart cath every time we want to. These patients need to be serially followed, so echo is the way to determine what the pulmonary pressures are. So it's defined as a, uh, the equation is four times the uh, uh, velocity of peak TR plus the RA pressure. Uh, RA pressure is estimated by IBC, as everyone knows. If it collapses by more than 50% and it is not dilated, it, the right atrial pressure is 3. If it's dilated and it doesn't collapse, it's 15. And if it's um, uh, if the, the two measurements don't agree, then the right atrial pressure is 8. Uh, finally, ECHO has a, uh, a role in guidance for percutaneous versus surgical therapy. Uh, balloon mitrovalvuloplasty is the treatment of choice in rheumatic uh, mitral stenosis in suitable patients. It's less invasive than surgery and has uh, uh, satisfying results. Works by inflating a balloon in the mitral valve itself, which causes splitting of the fused commissures. And it's considered a success when the mitral valve area is more than 1.5 centimeters after the procedure with less than plus 2 MR. Uh, patients who aren't candidates for this are offered surgery instead. Typically, we try to do a mitral valve repair uh, to uh, rather than a uh, mitral valve uh, replacement, but sometimes it's inevitable and we have to replace the valve. So echo, uh, how do we, we determine who is a, a candidate for valvuloplasty versus not? So first, they have to be severe MS uh, and they have to be symptomatics. Uh, they has to be, uh, we have to evaluate the mitral regurgitation because moderate to severe mitral regurgitation means you are not a candidate for balloon valvuloplasty. Left atrial appendage should be uh, assessed for the presence of thrombus, as that is also a contraindication to proceeding with balloon valvuloplasty. And then we want to assess the degree of calcification of the mitral valve, because significantly calcified valves should go for surgery rather than uh, balloon valvuloplasty. Now, echo also has a role intraprocedurally. So uh, this can be done either with fluoroscopic or echo guidance. But I can, as you can see with echo guidance in panel A, you can see the transeptal needle going into the intraatrial septum. Uh, we can see the same thing on the 3D echo there. On this view, it's a 3D echo of after they went through the septum. That's the uh, uh, balloon-tipped catheter going through the intraatrial septum. Uh, fluoroscopy, this is uh, the... Uh, uh, sorry, I don't know why that says hemodynamic assessment of aortic valve, but that is the dilation of the mitral valve itself. And then they assess the valve after the procedure. Again, we said pressure half time has a limited role here and mainly assessed by planimetry. You can see the mitral valve area went from 0.5 to 1.7 centimeters squared. And this is a video of 3D echo pre and post balloon valvuloplasty. You can see the valve opens much more nicely here. Some of the complications to watch out for, which again, use echo to monitor, is we wanna look out for any cardiac tamponade. We wanna look for, out for severe MR, uh, which is one of the potential complications, either from leaflet tearing, leaflet perforation, or papillary muscle rupture from the balloon. And then we did do a transeptal fracture, so we wanna just assess that after the procedure to make sure there isn't a uh, major septal shunt. And yeah. I believe that is the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you for your time. If anyone has any uh, questions or comments. So thank you, Assis, for such a great uh, comprehensive review of the rheumatic uh, uh, cardiac uh, valve conditions, especially you mentioned all the acute and chronic, as well as the uh, coverage of all the valve involvement. So it's very, very comprehensive. So just a word of uh, acknowledgement, uh, at St. Michael's Hospital, we had the privilege of having Dr. Bob Chisholm, uh, who had uh, pioneered the percutaneous uh, mitral valvuloplasty, uh, not only in our hospital, but also in the province of Ontario. So we have the privilege of having him and actually uh, bringing in lots of patients uh, 
who had uh, rheumatic heart diseases uh, to our echo lab. And uh, when I first arrived at St. Michael's Hospital uh, about 20 years ago, and uh, I thought uh, we were having an epidemic of uh, rheumatic heart disease because every Tuesday afternoon, uh, when Dr. Chisholm was having his clinic, we would have a flood of all the echoes with rheumatic heart disease. So uh, once again, uh, thanks, Bob. And uh, we continue to do a, a PMB in our hospital. And uh, we're very privileged to be able to provide a very comprehensive uh, 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 valve therapy for many of our patients uh, with uh, many uh, non-invasive uh, device, uh, or rather, you know, uh, non-open heart uh, uh, device therapy for our uh, high valve patients. Um, so, um, uh, without further ado, uh, any comments or questions from our colleagues or participants today? You can also type your questions into the chat box as well. Um, one other thing I can mention is uh, the usage of a Wilkins score uh, for selection of a percutaneous mitral valve uh, It was actually developed by Dr. Jerry Wilkins as well as uh, Dr. Nat Wayman at uh, Mass General uh, almost like uh, I think 25 or 30 years ago. And oh, it looks at a, a number of uh, criteria in terms of uh, leaflet thickenings, valvular calcification, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so it remains very useful uh, for our management. I think it's also useful to know uh, for the Royal College exam as well, because that would come up and uh, some of the uh, calculations of, for uh, mitral stenosis in terms of uh, um, the pressure half time as well as the piece of formula are uh, useful uh, to know as well uh, for the exam as well, uh, both in the uh, Canadian Royal College exam as well as the American Society ECHO uh, exam as well. Good. Any other questions or comments? Hey, Aziz, it's Patrick. Uh, I was listening to your presentation on and off because I had another another thing, but uh, it was very good. Uh, I just had a question about uh, antibiotic prophylaxis because uh, like uh, where I was in Sherbrooke in Quebec, we didn't see that much rheumatic uh, valve disease, but here we see it a, a lot. Um, well, what's your take on antibiotic uh, prophylaxis after uh, um, acute rheumatic fever? Um, that's an excellent question, Patrick. Unfortunately, I didn't really look into this. I was most um, really focused on the echo aspect, but okay. that's something I can definitely look into. It's a very interesting question because, yeah, it's not something we run into that often. And as far as I'm aware, most of the antibiotic prophylaxis is during the pediatric period uh, or unless someone turns 21, I'd, I'd have to review the exact guideline. Yeah, because I think it, it extends onto uh, on adult age, but I was just meaning to ask because uh, uh, it, we don't see that much uh, my rheumatic val heart valve disease in Quebec. So uh, I was thinking I could uh, ask the question about what's done in practice if anybody else uh, has encountered such patient uh, in Toronto. Yeah, Patrick, no, so that's a good question. Uh, I think I might be able to answer that, uh, Dr. Chow. So there's uh, there's some guidelines, but the guidelines differ depending on where you are for uh, pro antibiotic prophylaxis in the context of acute rheumatic fever, not necessarily with uh, rheumatic mitral, like the late complications of rheumatic mitral stenosis. If I remember correctly, I'll have to look it up, but I think the, the, uh, the recommendation is that it's... Uh, more than 10 years or until they're 40, which everyone is longer, they remain on antibiotic prophylaxis uh, as suppressive antibiotics to reduce the chance of recurrent valvulitis caused by rheumatic fever. Uh, and that would reduce the burden of disease uh, later in life. Thank you. Great. Yeah, it is, um, it is uh, the acute rheumatic uh, heart disease actually very rare in uh, in a developed world. So uh, much of what we see in our, is, uh, among the uh, immigrants as well as our ethnic population uh, uh, from the endemic region. And uh, so this is actually something that we, we deal with a lot because uh, Toronto being one of the center of uh, uh, first arrival for the immigrants uh, from all around the world. And being an ethnic Chinese, I, I, get a, I get quite a Few referral over the years, and I'm actually still following a lot of patients with rheumatic heart disease. Um, another interesting point to bring out is actually the 
use of POCUS. So um, as you all know, like one of the challenges of actually um, uh, screening uh, for rheumatic heart disease, both uh, acute and chronic, is actually uh, the use of echocardiography. And um, a POCUS has actually been shown in um, developing countries, so as to say, um, to actually be very useful. And uh, there's been a number of outreach program by the American Society Echo, as well as a number of our uh, Canadian colleagues who have reached out to uh, areas uh, such as Angola and uh, uh, other, other countries uh, to actually screen people. Uh, and uh, there's some papers written by our Canadian colleagues. I think there's a really worthwhile outreach program that uh, a number of our Canadian colleagues have actually done. So uh, kudos to them. Any other question? So without further ado, and thank you, Assis, for this very comprehensive review of uh, rheumatic heart uh, disease. And uh, we'll give you back about 11 minutes of your day. So remember that uh, there's a Toronto Valve uh, Symposium of Toronto Valve 2023 that is happening on 28th of uh, this month. Uh, Saturday is a half a day program. It starts from eight to one. Registration is free. You can go to Toronto Valves with an S dot com and uh, sign up. So once again, thank you. And I uh, hope we can see a lot of you there. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.